And we're live. Dr. David Ingram, please take it away. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Science Cafe, sponsored by Sigma Xi, the Scientific Honor Society, and the Office of the Vice President for Research. I'm David Ingram, the Vice President of the local chapter of Sigma Xi, and the Chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. This week's cafe will be the final cafe this semester, and it will be given by Professor Peter Harrington from Chemistry and Biochemistry on chemotyping natural medicines using spectroscopy and machine learning. Science Cafe information can be found at uh, www.ohio.edu slash science cafe. To keep up the participation of the audience, please put your questions in the chat. These will be asked during the talk by Rox. Now over to Professor Harrington. Hi, everybody. I'm just getting everything pulled up here. So we should be ready. Oh. So um, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to everyone about um, our, the research that we're doing. I'm just going to start off with a little introduction of um, some of the things that we do in my lab. Can everyone see my mouse on the screen? Rox, can you see it? Yes, so, I Yeah, we're, I'm going to tell you a little bit about chemometrics, but today we're not going to talk anything about the forensic work that we do in forensic chemistry. And then we do a lot of work, too, when we're looking at natural medicines with um, metabolomics, which is a study of small molecules. And we usually work at the intersection of these different um, circles that we have drawn here. So... Most of the stuff we do is either at the center or up here or, or down here. So the reason there's interest in um, natural medicines, and specifically in the United States botanicals, but we also find uh, fungal medicines uh, becoming an up-and-coming market as well, is it has a growing market value. So up on the top, we can say in 2019, the um, market value for herbal medicine was about $84.5 billion. And then one of the um, other aspects of herbal medicines is uh, cannabis. And we've been doing a lot of work with cannabis, but not limited to cannabis. We work with other natural medicines as well, such as um, ginseng, black cohosh, cinnamon, um, cranberry extracts, and uh, grapeseed extracts. So there's a, a growing market um, for these types of uh, natural medicines. So just a little bit about our approach here. So this is, a, as an analytical chemist, this is my view of the world. And out here around the outer circle, we have society. And then we have the, the outer core of the circle are all the sciences. And I can't possibly put all the sciences in. But central to the sciences is chemistry. And that's because chemistry is the study of matter and its interaction. So a lot of the other sciences depend on um, matter and its interaction. And then inside the circle, we have the five traditional areas of chemistry. We have organic chemistry, which is a study of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and how they interact. Physical chemistry, studying the physical properties of uh, chemicals. Inorganic chemistry, which is all the other stuff that's not included in organic chemistry. And biochemistry, looking at the large um, biomolecules that occur in life. And then central to this is analytical chemistry. And the reason analytical chemistry is a central science is it's devoted to making chemical measurements. And chemical measurements are important to scientists because if you want to find out if someone's a scientist, you just have to ask them one simple question. You just ask them, do you do experiments? If they do experiments, by definition, they're a scientist. If they're doing chemical experiments, then they need to rely on analytical chemistry to some degree or another. So we'll take it one step further and dive into analytical chemistry. And that, too, is made up of five um, traditional areas. There's quantitative analysis, which was one of the early forms of analytical chemistry, where we can measure quantities of different chemicals by measuring their volume and mass. Uh, spectroscopy, which we're going to be talking about today, is the interaction of light 
and matter or chemicals and how the light changes the chemical or how the chemical changes the light. In electrochemistry, we do the same thing, but instead of using light, we use electric fields. In separations, we can separate out different chemicals based on their different chemical properties. But central to that is this field called chemometrics. And this is, chemometrics is simply the discipline of getting the most information out of your experiments. So it's very valuable, not to chemists or analytical chemists, but to all scientists in general. And um, it can save you time and save you money. And if you happen to put chemometrics on your resume when you're looking for a job, it probably will double or triple your job opportunities. So the motivation here um, is looking at plant materials, which are very complex um, because they're living and organic. They're not something made like an um, aspirin tablet, where we know that it will contain two or three ingredients. So what we're going to do is use different modes of uh, measuring the plant materials. And these are different spectroscopies. Uh, we have nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, where we're look, working in the radio frequency range, such as your FM radio. Mass spectrometry, where we're working in the um, kilohertz range, and that would be your AM radio. Um, ultraviolet, which is the part of the light that is uh, beyond the blue range, the violet range that you can't see. And um, near infrared spectroscopy, which is the area between uh, the infrared spectral region, and this is where um, your heating lamps work at the restaurant when you're waiting for your food to come out and it's dry in your food. That red lamp is a near infrared source um, and the visible range. And when we do these spectral measurements, what you get is a spectrum that looks like this. And this happens to be spectra from 25 different uh, cannabis samples or extracts. And we can see that the patterns change with respect to wavelength or the frequency of the light. And then using machine learning, we can build models that tell us and allow us to identify what the different samples are, the cultivars or products, based solely on their spectrum. And this type of structure looks a little bit like a tree. And things at the very top are, are very different and things that are separated at the very bottom are very similar. So we get a lot of inductive information from these models too. So this is just a, an overview of sort of the approach we're gonna use. We're gonna take plants, um, usually do an extract, but sometimes we can look at the plant itself, um, look at the spectral patterns, and then try and arrange those patterns, find rules that allow us to identify what the samples are or the quality of the product. So, a little more of a review of spectroscopy is that we have um, light coming in that interacts with the sample and it can generate a spectrum where we see light emitted in a variety of different frequencies or wavelengths. Uh, we also see this with the prism. Uh, we have white light coming in and it separates out from red to violet light. Uh, shorter wavelengths here, longer wavelengths here. Now the advantage of using spectroscopy is it's very fast. Specifically, if we put, um, I keep losing my mouse here, but if we put a digital camera at the end, we can measure all the different uh, wavelengths or frequencies at the same time. So that means we can do a lot of samples very quickly, which is going to be good for industry. So. Um, it just basically is giving us information about the chemical composition by the way the light is interacting with the sample. Um, and then sometimes, and I'll give you an example of this, with near-infrared spectroscopy, we can make the measurement right through the container. We don't have to um, take the sample out. It's an in-situ uh, measurement. Um, Raman spectroscopy has this process of uh, ability as well. We also use microplate readers where we can take a well plate with 96 different wells and put different cells in them, or samples of the cells. And then this will go through and one at a time measure the spectrum for everything in the cell. So uh, molecular devices donated a, a, one of these um, instruments to us that are very kind. 
And we've been using that too for profiling a lot of foods and plant materials. So how do we characterize something that was once alive or living? Well, the, the one that's probably most popular is genotyping, which means that we're going to look at the genetic information to find out how to identify what this organism may be. Now, that may be a different plant, a different animal, or a fungus. But a lot of factors will affect the, the genes that are being expressed. And the, when the genes are expressed, it affects the properties of the organism. And we call that the phenotype. Um, and in a lot of cases, it will affect the morphology, which is basically the size and shape of the organism. And this is usually what is used for studying botanical materials, um, specifically vouchered samples. Um, but the phenotype also affects what's going on inside the organism um, by changing the chemical composition. And since we're looking at natural medicines, we're interested in the chemicals that are occurring inside that plant or organism that we're interested in studying. And we call that the chemotype. So basically, a chemotype is simply a way of classifying something by the chemicals that it's made out of. Um, just a little aside, they had a case in a poisoning case in China where um, a mushroom was being sold. And if the mushroom grew in northern China, um, it was safe to eat. But when it was grown in southern China under a warm climate, it started to produce toxins and became toxic. And eight people had died from eating this mushroom. But both uh, the uh, northern mushroom and southern mushroom were the exact same species and had the same DNA. It was the environment that caused it from being um, going from a safe mushroom to a toxic mushroom. So the other problem with plants is a lot of times we'll find the distribution of the chemicals that we want aren't uniformly distributed through the plant. So again, I'm using marijuana here, and we have or cannabis. Here we have the genus, we have the species, and usually there are two that are most common, indica and sativa. And they're now considered the same species and actually different subspecies. And then down here we have the chemotype. So we can have different chemical compositions for the same species of plant. And that all also depends on the growing condition. But also throughout the plant, we have this little graph here showing the uh, THC content will vary from where you happen to be harvesting the plant. So we find the highest um, concentration of THC in the flowering buds of, of this plant. Um, we can also do some basic chemotyping simply by looking at the ratio of two compounds. So can everyone see the bottom of my screen? Rox, is the, the bottom axis visible? Okay. Um, so the vertical axis is the percent of uh, cannabidiol, CBD, and the horizontal axis um, happens to be the THC concentration. And we can divide the uh, plants up into three basic uh, chemotypes simply by looking at the composition of these two compounds. But there are over 70 different cannabinoid compounds that we are, um, or no, more than 70, about 120 different cannabinoids. And they all interact and tend to be important. So we want to look at more than just two things that are occurring in the plant. And this leads us to sort of this controversial term called the entourage effect. So one of the reasons natural or botanical medicines are popular is that they're made up of hundreds or thousands of chemical components. And a lot of times that can be important in terms of enhancing the activity or mitigating, uh, decreasing any side effects. So the idea is if we just took out, for example, the CBD and left everything else behind, then we may not get the same effect um, in terms of the medicinal properties. Along with that is also the organoleptic effect, the, uh, the aroma and flavor. So. A lot of times, too, the appeal for natural medicines is due to the sensations that they provide um, when they're consumed. So the idea of the chemotype is we're getting a, a snapshot of the chemical composition, and that's what's basically going to affect the uh, pharmacological activity, how the plant or medicine is going to affect uh, you. 
Um, genetic and morphological uh, approaches usually fail um, because the pharmacological activity is influenced by growing conditions or uh, for the environment or um, harvesting times, uh, for example. Um, it also, they also fail when the medicines are in the form of a powder, oil, or a tincture because now we can't see the, the plant size and shape to do the identification. So what we're interested in doing is using chemometrics and what it's going to do for us is to relate the spectra that we're going to measure very quickly with our instruments to some property that we're interested in predicting. And I, I have some examples coming up. It may be identifying specific samples from uh, vendors or it could be uh, identifying um, high versus low um, THC content plants. And um, we're going to do this with a variety of tools. And the, the one that I'm going to end with will be uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, which um, you've probably, ha if you haven't heard of this, you will be hearing about it soon. So the way this all works is very simple. If we have three peaks in our spectrum labeled X, Y, and Z, we could simply take the area or the peak height and represent this in three-dimensional space and draw a vector. And we usually we don't care about the whole length of the vector. We just care about the point at the tip. And you'll see that. Now, as humans, we can visualize three dimensions very easily. But the math will still work for tens, hundreds, thousands, and millions of dimensions. And in some cases, the number of dimensions we'll be working with or the number of points or features in our spectrum may be uh, one million or even more. So the important thing to remember is when we use this vector approach to encode a spectrum, is that the direction of the vector tells us what it is, and the length of the vector will tell us how much we have, the quantitative information. So uh, here's uh, one of our first um, examples, is we're using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy I put these, this FM radio in there to just show you that we're in, working with the interaction of radio waves or light with really long wavelengths um, with uh, the sample. And what we see up on top is a sample of uh, marijuana or a high THC sample. And down below uh, should be hemp in blue um, is the low uh, THC content uh, samples. And then we're going to use a technique called principal component analysis. It's a very handy tool, and it's very simple. So we can take our three-dimensional space, which we can see over here, or a hundred-dimensional or a million-dimensional space, and we just draw a plane through it. And we put this plane where it's going to maximize the spread of all the points or tips of our vectors. And when we do this, we get these very easy to interpret plots where you can see the separation in two dimensions. And the reason two dimensions are good is it's quantitative. So if I want to find out if um, purple is closer to green or magenta is closer to green, I can take out my ruler and measure it and measure this distance here with the ruler and find out which group is closest together. You can't do that with a three-dimensional plot. So a lot of times we like to do everything in two dimensions. So here's our plot again. And uh, red is the marijuana, which we use as a term for high THC content. And blue is hemp, which is what we use for low THC content, and usually high CBD content. And then here is what the um, principal component um, analysis looks like. And you can see a lot of the hemp samples are all grouped far away, but we do have one cluster that's sort of surrounded or tracking in the center of the uh, marijuana uh, samples. And what the different letters are, are different samples from different commercial uh, distributors. Um, just another example of what we can do is there's a, a gun here to the left, and this is hooked up to our near infrared spectrometer, and there's light coming through using fiber optics. And we're measuring hemp oil in this vial, and the light's going to go through the vial be reflected back and back through the gun through different fiber optics and into the instrument. And then it'll generate a spectrum that we have over here. Um, we usually do a conversion to make it similar to absorbance by taking the base 10 logarithm of the reflectance spectrum. But when we apply chemometrics to it, 
we get a very nice line indicating that we're able to predict from the near infrared spectrum the CBD concentration in the hemp oil. Um, down here is our control of reference because this is measured by HPLC, a standard method. And this is what we're predicting using the near infrared spectrum. And you can see that it, it works quite well. We get a good ballpark figure um, for quality assurance. So, for example, if there was no CBD or too much CBD, we would know right away. And it's fast. Yes? You have your first question, which actually oh, refers back to your uh, previous slide uh, with the, the hemp and uh, the marijuana. Right. What the person is asking is, is that really natural variation in the samples or is it more a mislabeling or a fraudulent sample? No, no, they're all natural variations. So the, the problem here is this is just a very simple approach to um, looking at the data. And what we can do is we can take our two-dimensional plane and tilt it in different directions and, and see that we can separate out the, the hemp from the marijuana. And I have some results coming up a little bit later showing that we're getting about 95% or higher recognition rates. But it's a good question. So th that's the other thing that makes things very tricky with biological substances is the natural variations that occur. So we, we're always interested in scaling up to get as many samples as we can, which means then the methods have to be low cost, and fast, high throughput, because that's the only way you can overcome this natural variation that's going to occur. So here's an example of ginseng. Um, on the left, we have UV spectra. We just narrowed the range down, and we have um, three different types of ginseng. We have the Panax ginseng, which is um, the Chinese version of ginseng, and then we have Panax Noto ginseng, which grows in north, northeastern China and Korea. And then we have the quinacofolis, is the uh, U.S. version of ginseng. And the quinacofolis has the highest market value. It's grown primarily in Wisconsin. And there's always concern that um, ginseng being sold in the market is actually the uh, lower cost uh, Chinese ginseng that's maybe falsely labeled. So this project was actually sponsored by, there's a Wisconsin Ginseng Growers Association, and that went through the USDA and then through to my research group. So there are a lot of ways of doing this. We have targeted analysis, which means we know exactly what we're trying to find or what we're looking for. So in this case, we have three species of ginseng that we're interested in identifying. But then we also have untargeted analysis where we have no idea what may be in the sample. And this is very important for adulteration and adulterated samples. Um, so well, the next example I'm going to show you is going to be using non-targeted analysis. And what we're interested in doing is characterizing uh, our a standard sample from anything that looks different. So we usually call this, it's basically a Sesame Street question of is it the same or is it different? So um, down here, um, when we're asking that question, that would be the modeling part. Where we look for similarities in a group of spectra. But when we are also trying to do discrimination, targeted um, analysis, we're looking for differences between known groups of um, materials. So again, this is useful when we know that we have three or four species that we want to identify or three or four geographical regions we're trying to identify. So one of the ways to characterize this, and this is something that I, I was on an expert panel that helped to develop the standard, is called probability of identification. We're trying to estimate um, how reliable our detection methods were um, based on the concentration of an adulterant. So we, we did a study um, and this would just be an example up here where um, we're using modeling and we would train with the U.S. ginseng and we would adulterate it with different levels of Chinese ginseng. And we end up getting something that looks like this S-shaped curve. So what we want to do is exclude values that have been adulterated from our model. 
So we want, with that, want that to be identified as a zero because our identification is, is it U.S. ginseng? But if something is 100% or 99% U.S. ginseng, we would want that value to be up here at one. So this is just sort of an ideal graph um, from the, the papers that were, the initial paper that was written. And then this is um, comparing two methods. Uh, one in um, green is a standard method. Oh, why did we just flip back to my, for some reason we just mysteriously flipped out of my screen show. Okay, there we go. So um, the one in blue is a method that we developed at Ohio University. So you can see that we're much more sensitive to the adulteration level using this new method that we developed. Um, once we're below 97% uh, purity, we can start detecting um, adulteration occurring. And what we're really interested in doing is being down here at 92. So it means that if the sample is adulterated at all above um, 92, we'll not identify it as U.S. ginseng. Um, we can say that the standard method um, works fairly well down here, at, again, at low levels of adulteration, but it's not as sensitive to the uh, intermediate adulterations that are occurring around 95%. Now, in terms of economic adulteration, things usually work in reverse. Usually it'll be maybe 5% U.S. ginseng and 95% the cheaper product, the 95% uh, mm -hmm. Chinese ginseng. Pete, you have a question. Sure. So um, what they say is, is that most pharmaceuticals are regulated by the FDA. They want to know, is there a regulatory agency in the U.S. that regulates natural products and regularly tests products? Well, uh, no, there isn't a federal um, regulation body, but the um, U.S. United States Pharmacopeia, USP, is an industry uh, group, so it's supposed to be self-regulated. So this is something to look for if you're interested in buying natural uh, medicines, is it should have a USP label on it. And the other label that's very important to look for is GMP, which is Good Manufacturing Practices. So those two labels are usually put on there by the, the USP. And then the FDA does inspections too. So some um, companies will uh, volunteer. I don't think they're required to have the uh, Food and Drug Administration inspect them, but they will volunteer to be inspected just so they can put an FDA label on as well. And that usually helps in terms of uh, selling the products. So again, here we have um, some NMR spectra, 25 different uh, cannabis samples. And what we're going to see is when we do the principal component analysis, that they're sort of, they, they sort of group over, okay over here. We, these are very different. We see nice clusters. And then we have some that are sitting on top of one another, especially this group uh, right here. But what we're going to do is use a different machine learning model that's going to, to use a divide and conquer approach and divide this into a tree. So what we're looking at is what's called a classification tree. And you can see in this case, every sample is being correctly uh, recognized. So we do this with what we call rules. And since we have 25 classes, there'll be 24 rules to do the separation. And the, the biggest differences occur at the first branch. And as we move down, uh, we get closer and uh, um, spectra that appear to be closer to each other, more similar. And the inference there is the chemical properties and the pharmacological properties will also be similar. So this is also useful from a marketing standpoint. So if you're interested in finding a natural medicine with a specific property, um, and it might be a blend, herbal blend um, of different herbs or plants, then you might need some guidance. They, they say, well, you might want to try looking at this other blend as well because they occur together in the same chemical space. Um, this is just showing a little bit of our ability to um, make uh, predictions and do identifications. So if we look over here, uh, ABS means we're using all the information in the NMR spectrum. 
and, and real means we're using half the information. Um, the, the lowest, uh, the worst result is at 94% uh, correction. But we can get as high as 99.5 uh, accuracies in terms of identifying the samples based on their spectrum. Um, this is a mass spectrum. There are 2,000 dimensions in the spectrum or 2,000 data points. So we're going to a very highly dimensional um, space. And again, if we look at the principal component analysis, it's a big mess. It looks like alphabet soup got spilled on the table. But if we put it into our classification tree, we can separate everything out perfectly so that um, we're recognizing all 25 classes. And, um, and we'll, we'll see a little bit later what the uh, results will be. Oh, right down here are showing some results. Um, the important thing is to just look down here at the lower table and you can see that if we do some transformations on the data, we can get as high as 99.9% classification rates. And these are all different machine learning um, methods that you can use. So we have a whole variety of, or host of uh, tools that are available to us. So that takes me a little bit into the AI part or the machine learning part. Um, so, this is, I have this picture of the Terminator just to uh, remind me. So, AI or artificial intelligence is sort of a misleading term because it's not really artificial. It's more in a computer emulating human intelligence. And it's kind of amazing some of the things that the computer is able to do using some of the modern advances. And I will... Um, uh, talk about that a little bit more um, as we go on. But basically, we're going to take bodies of data, like the spectra that I was showing you, and how the computer learn how to make an association. So the we have a very simple formula here, y equals f uh, of x, and x is our spectrum, and y is whatever we want to know about our sample. And then we sort of allow these methods to find it out. So in terms of marketing, you're going to see AI appearing just about basically everywhere. Um, and a lot of people are still confused about artificial intelligence and, and machine intelligence, but I'm going to try and simplify it for you the best I can. But this is a Burger King uh, commercial, and they claim that it was written by AI. Um, here's another ad from Apple, I'm not endorsing Apple, but I want to point out that um, they're, again, they're trying to include this, these concepts of intelligence, bionics, and neural engine. And we'll, we'll be going into the neural part in just another slide or two. So um, some of the things that uh, AI is going to do is going to replace people for customer service. Um, it can extract information from data in real time. So it's very fast. So it's good at that. Um, voice recognition, image recognition. So when you go into Facebook and you put a picture of yourself and your friends up and it starts tagging everyone in the picture, that again is um, machine um, learning or AI at work. Language translation I use all the time. Uh, Google Translate on my phone. I can turn on my camera, show it a menu in China, and finally find out what it is I'm about to order. So, um, and then grammar checking and writing also is another application. Um, but pretty much everything you're going to be buying in the future will have some form of AI with it, basically for marketing, but also maybe because it has some utility. So we'll start seeing it appearing in things like toaster ovens and air fryers and refrigerators, where you can talk to your refrigerator, for example, or your refrigerator can talk to you. So the way this works is something called deep learning, and it's going to use very complicated neural networks. And again, I mentioned it's successful in image recognition, voice recognition, self-driving cars wouldn't be possible without it. Um, the problem is that it's difficult to train and um, train these types of multi-layer networks, but I'll go through that. And the big in innovation was um, the restricted Boltzmann machine, uh, which we have been working on. 
So the idea there is we train each layer independently and then stack them together to form a deep network. So here's where I'm going to do a little demonstration. Um, if you go into Google too, uh, Yanni versus Laurel is an audio illusion. You may have heard of optical illusions before, but this is a fun one to try at home. But I'm going to do, oh, I forgot I turned my phone off so I wouldn't be bothered. I'm going to do a little demonstration here with um, Siri. But I want to just uh, mention to you, if you look at these patterns up here, of these uh, voice recordings, they look very similar to chemical spectrum. So the recordings are up here in black, and then down here they're sort of just decomposing them by frequency and uh, phase. But, um, okay, let's go in. So when I talk to Siri, she's actually doing quite a bit of work. So she's gonna take that voice pattern I showed you earlier and convert it into digital commands. Hey Siri, tell me a joke. I couldn't figure out why the baseball kept getting larger. Then it hit me. Did everyone hear that? Okay, one, one more demo. Hey Siri, what is zero divided by zero? Imagine that you have zero cookies and you split them evenly among zero friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense. And Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies. And your friends are sad because they don't exist. Oh wow, this escalated quickly. So this is just showing a little bit of the power that you have with these deep um, learning networks. So let's go see how this all is gonna work. So the basic processing unit is emulates a, a neuron that we're used to seeing in our brain where we have the dendrites up here and an axon down here. And this could be simulated on a computer simply by taking a sum of weights and if the weights are positive, they're activations. And if they're negative, they're inhibitions. And then putting it into the, what's this, this nonlinear function that basically converts everything from zero to one. And that's kind of important, too, because if we didn't have this yellow part, then we wouldn't really be doing anything. We'd just be doing a big matrix calculation. But by making it nonlinear, um, we get new information out as we move through each layer. So just as an ex example, if we're trying to emulate and logic, which means that if x1 and x2 are both 1, we have a value of 1 or true, and everything else is 0, we can do that by taking a weight vector in this green uh, box here and positioning it so we have a plane that's going to divide this one from these two zeros. However, if we have an exclusive OR, which means when what x1 is true and x2 is zero, we get a true value, or x2 is true and x1 is false, we get a true value, then we can't do the separation with one plane anymore. But if we combine two boxes, we use two boxes here and combine them together here in a layer, then we can um, simulate this uh, more complicated logic that we couldn't do with a single unit. So what we're gonna say is by adding more units and more layers, we get higher degrees of our ability to separate points in our data space. So this is just showing a picture of um, a, a very simple neural network. And even, uh, these have been around since the 1980s. Um, what you're going to see, though, is they've been becoming larger and larger. So this would be what's called a deep learning neural network. We have one that's even deeper, where we have lots of data and lots of layers. Now, there's kind of a problem here with doing this. Uh, one is, is speed, but the other one is and this, is, this article has started a whole trend among philosophers of the end of science, is that if we learn from these deep neural networks, all the information is distributed through the connections. It's really difficult to find out what is it that our network has learned and what is it using to make its decision. And there are all sorts of disastrous cases where this has happened. 
So this is uh, one article. It's one of the very first ones that came out about big data and deep learning and that it'll be the end of science and the end of theory. Here's another one by a guy that you might recognize. It's a little more, more popular. David Byrne for the Talking Heads wrote this uh, article, Big Data and the End of Science. But one of my jobs in terms of Kevin Metrics is keeping the science in. And that means we have to be able to go backwards through these deep networks. And then here's one of my other favorite quotes by Bertrand Russell, is science is what you know, philosophy is what you don't know. So this all, made, one of the main guys that made this possible is Jeff Hinton, who's a professor at Toronto University and the chief scientific officer at Google. So he has access to lots of data. Um, he developed this method called the restricted Boltzmann machine. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But on the left, we have a Boltzmann machine. And then he just cut all these connections where everything is connected in the same layer and get something just like we saw before with the, the very simple uh, neural networks that we originally started with. And the advantage to his approach is that we can train each one of these individually and very quickly. And then we can assemble them together to make a deep network. And then at the very top, we can put a, another chemometrics modeling method to interpret what's coming out, the, out of the end and get some useful, useful information from it. So this is just an example of some things that we can do. Um, this isn't a botanical material. It happens to be meat, or basically hamburger meat. And we're using near-infrared spectro spectroscopy, that gun I showed you before. And what we're doing is we're predicting the amount of fat in the meat by using the near-infrared spectrum, which is very fast. So if we use a restricted Boltzmann machine, we can get a very much better precision on our predictions than if we use um, the same approach without the restricted Boltzmann machine. So basically what it's going to do is it's just going to make new variables for us to look at. Um, again, this is something I developed. Uh, we call it the easy RBM because it's easy to use and it's fast. And um, we also put in the original linear data as well, which helps. And then we can see the effect of adding layers. So um, if we just focus on this bottom row here, we can see that uh, as we add layers, we still get very good um, performance. Um, in this case, when we don't augment, adding more layers marginally improves the performance. Um, down here, uh, the performance gets worse as we add layers. But if we augment it, use all the data that we have available to us, the uh, performance uh, either um, increases or stays the same with the additional layers being added in. So what we're looking at then is what happens um, at each layer and we can see that we can extract out um, different key features from the near infrared spectrum. So we say with three layers, this is a very important peak in terms of uh, doing the identification. Um, this, again, is another example with the SVM. And this is uh, looking at UV spectra from uh, um, cannabis samples for a, a specific class. So we can go back through the RBM layer by layer and see the important features for doing the uh, classification. So um, Pete, you yes. have a question, if I could. So okay. somebody uh, says, uh, boy, this is a lot of technical um, things that you've done. And they were just curious, who uses this really high level science? Are there practical experiences where somebody has used this very advanced technology and what are some of those stories? Well, not really in chemistry. So we're sort of the pioneers in using it in chemistry. But in mm -hmm. other technologies, such as self-driving cars, robotics, um, telecommunications and designing phones, the, the engineers seem to be at the head of the game. But mm -hmm. it's, it's it's very easy for us to take the information that you would get from a, a camera or um, a phone and see that those signals are very similar to the signals that we get from the analytical instruments. 
So mm -hmm. the idea is to put these two things together to develop a smart or intelligent instrument. So, so you know, originally you said that, you know, in order for techniques to be practical, they have to be cheap and fast. And that because you have natural products with several components that you need to be able to analyze a whole bunch of data sets, right? Right. So with this new methodology, this combination of methodologies, does that allow you to still be cheap and fast and, and look at lots of data? Yeah, so the cheap and fast part is getting the data, right? So if you're gonna have lots of data, you have to do it efficiently which means the instruments have to be low cost. They have to be put on. The best case scenario is putting them on site as part of an industrial process, such as having a flow cell or a mm -hmm. conveyor belt where you're scanning the instruments. And these exist. The pharmaceutical industry uses it all the time. So, for example, when they're producing tablets, every tablet they can collect a near infrared spectrum from. So, um, well, then once we have the big data, it's not that difficult if you have efficient algorithms for doing the model building. And you only do that once. That's a one-time thing. And then mm -hmm. what happens is that gets used for doing the identification for future samples. So it would basically be a three-step process. So first you collect the data off, off your line. And then the other issue is someone else has to confirm that, that what that data is. So assuming that you have standard materials, you can do it. Otherwise, you have to do a different assay and analyze the data, which could take be very time consuming and expensive. But you only have to do that one time. And then with that, you can then build your models. And then from those models, once you have them, they can start making new predictions. So, and then every once in a while, you need to do a quality assurance check by running a standard material through to make sure that your predictions are accurate. But that, that's the basic idea. Okay, so, from a practical point of view, and I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase another okay. question here. So, you can use it for manufacturing to make sure that, you know, what you think you have is actually what you have. But could you also use it from like a forensics point of view where, you know, somebody's poisoned or, you know, uh, there's this mysterious compound and they don't know what it is and now you're trying to identify it. Is that one of the applications of this technology? Yes, but it even goes further than that. It goes all the way out to this concept of the tricorder where you could make a small handheld instrument that someone could take shopping and they could hold up to, for example, fruit or vegetables and, and get a measurement of what the vitamin concentration would be or the oh. age or quality. So um, ultimately, it, it will. The, there are a lot of driving factors. One is making small handheld instruments that mm -hmm. would be the size of your phone or even coupled to your phone. And then... Um, you could actually upload the information through the Wi-Fi to some central server that's doing all the uh, modeling and mm -hmm. do these determinations. So, um, and then finally for first responders, we, we have this concept of what we call a personal hygiene monitor. So typically what's done is you have a strip of activated charcoal. So if you're in a dangerous situation or a dangerous environment, the chemicals get absorbed onto the charcoal, and then at the end of the week or at the end of your trip, you turn it into the lab, and they'll develop it and tell you what chemicals you're exposed to. But that doesn't do you any good because it doesn't alarm or alert you that you're in this bad situation. It just tells you that you are there. So by having a small, smaller real-time instruments that can do this, um, it's very useful for people like the Coast Guard, where they have to go into holes of ships where a lot of fumes and uh, toxic compounds can accumulate in the air. Or um, firefighters, for example, especially if a chemistry building catches on fire, who knows what's gonna be burning and in the air. So they could be alerted right away that there's something um, dangerous going on. And also Homeland Security. So there's always this concern too that someone's gonna put some toxic compound into an intake vent to a 
air conditioning system and try and poison a whole building. So there's interest in developing monitors for monitoring air ha handlers as well. So, Thank you. That's interesting. But, yeah, unfortunately, these are all things we have to worry about in this day and age. So I, I'm just going to do a demo here. We're going to take a thousand variables in our mass spectrum and, and process through three layers of our RVM. And then we're going to use a support vector classifier. And this is for a project I did, I'm doing with John Staser, where we're interested in looking at lignin biomass mass spectra. And what you can say is, if we don't do anything, we have a nice clean separation of our, the samples um, A or before the reactor, and the samples B or after the reactor. And then what we're going to do is do the same technique, principal component analysis, after each layer. And you can see the separation gets worse, and then it gets better, and then it gets slightly better. But what this does is allows us to compare the model that we developed here, where we didn't need the RVM, with what the model that we're going to develop here, where we're going to go through our three outputs and go backwards through the RPM, RVM and reproduce the uh, classifiers. And what you can see is that the two are virtually identical. So this shows us that when we have these uh, multi-layer networks that they're deep, we can go back through and see the features that are being used for the identification. So in other words, if we look at the uh, oxidize, these big peaks here are all things that are being created when we oxidize the neat ligand, lignin. And if we look at this negative peak, this is a peak that was in lignin that's decreasing as it goes through the reactor. So this allows us then to put the, the chemistry back into the chemometrics and, and start doing science again and make new discoveries. So I see I'm almost out of time, so we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. But uh, in conclusion, by using spectroscopy, it, it's nice because unlike chromatography, it doesn't have a lot of consumables. And mm -hmm. it's uh, fast and fairly easy to use for getting a chemical snapshot of almost any type of material. So it's good for characterization and authentication of botanical products, but also anything that's complex or complicated. Um, the RBMs are, are very robust um, that we developed, and uh, they minimize errors, and that also helps in their reconstructed inputs. That doesn't mean anything to anyone, so I didn't go into that level of detail. Um, mm -hmm. Our linear inputs accommodate analytical measurements, and augmentation allows us to generate even more variables. And the important thing is we're putting the science back into the models by being able to go back through and interpret the models so we can make new discoveries. And with that, I'll just leave my acknowledgement slide up and answer um, any questions that may have popped into people's minds. So I, I do have some questions. So how many chemicals are typically in natural products and specifically cannabis? Okay, well, I would like to say that the that question is defined at how low you go or what's the lowest concentration you look at. So if you look at high concentration components, um, there, there may be like 50 or 100, but if you go down to the part per billion level, you know, it's pretty much undefined. And we also have mixtures of different biopolymers like proteins, and those proteins can be modified. Um, I, I know that in the human body, I think they say there are 10,000 different proteins, so there are quite a few. But basically, okay. they have to be high enough concentration as well to have some effect. So um, I, I think in terms of cannabinoids, they're about 120. And then we have things called flavanols and flavonoids and terpenes and terpenoids. And those are basically affecting some of the other health properties, but also the flavor, aroma, and taste as well. So it's not a, a question where I can say 87 it has a dis <laughs> discrete number. It's really undefined. Okay. This is an interesting question. Quote, if I were to give you a glass of wine, could you tell me the varietal and the region 
and when it was harvested. Well, that's a, another area that's active in research, and you'll find plenty of papers on this. So, really? Yes, but you need to have the uh, database established. So if they mm -hmm. gave it to me, I couldn't do it because I haven't built this database. But if you go to the literature, you can see that people have been doing this. And the way they do it is um, looking at the, one of the, uh, well, one of the most important areas is looking at the geographical region that the grapes were grown. Mm -hmm. And especially in European, Europe and European wines, a lot of times they're distinct um, wine growing uh, regions. And it's very important in terms of the authentication of the wines. So the way they do this is they look at the metal concentrations in the wines because the metals get uptaken from the soil. And this is a good way of determining the, um, the geography of where the wine came from. Um, the, the flavors and varieties can also be determined by the organic uh, concentration. Um, age of the wine, usually one of the things you can look at is tartic acid. It tends to crystallize out over time in wine. So if you have an old bottle of wine, you'll notice this uh, sort of tasteless crystal at the bottom. It's kind of white. It's tartic acid that sort of precipitates out. So um, don't hesitate to just put that question into Google, and you can find some scientific papers on it um, as well. And then there are also um, cold, different cultivars of the wine. Uh, but, you know, if you're trying to distinguish uh, Pinot Noir from Pinot Grigio, that would be very easy for me to do. Okay. So question, uh, you mentioned that you were part of an expert panel. Do you ever consult? And yes. tell us about it. Well, I, I get recruited. I consulted for the USP, the United States uh, Pharmacopeia. I was mm -hmm. on their chemometrics uh, expert panel. And we created a document which is a guideline of how to use chemometrics in the pharmaceutical industry. So, um, and they're also expanding out into botanicals. I, I volunteered for their cannabis um, panel several times, but they haven't, I haven't been selected. So, um, and then with AOAC, I was on, and I think I still am on a panel. Oh, AOC, um, it used to be, um, well, I can't remember now what it used to be. They don't. They got rid of the name and they just became the uh, acronym. So they're mm -hmm. now called AOEC International, but something like the Association of Official Analytical Chemists. And they are basically agricultural chemists. So I'm on the panel there for um, botanical identification that, that they have. And I think those are the only two I'm on now, but I serve on review panels, expert panels all the time. Another question is, is you referred to uh, the fraud with ginseng and the person wants to know how common is fraud with natural products and should they be worried? Okay, well, I, I'm going to qualify that question. First off, it's not only natural products, but with the global marketplace, and all these online stores, no matter what you're buying, you need to be concerned about fraud. So there's a lot of counterfeit items being uh, produced. 8% um, of China's gross domestic product is um, pirated or bootlegged um, items. So uh, it's basically buyer beware. And if you're, you see a deal that's too good to be true, it probably is. So the key thing is to buy from uh, reputable sources um, if, you, if you're worried about fraud. But um, it happens with everything from olive oil to, oh, and he, here's a little tip, is if you like olive oil, like I do, mm -hmm. um, there's a, a trick that's done. Instead of using olives that are grown in a region, like I used to like this uh, Florentine olive oil. Uh, what they do is they get the olives from Africa and then they bottle it in Florence and sell it as Florentine olive oil. You can find this information on the labels, but you just have to know to look there to see if the olives were grown there or if the um, bottling occurred there. 
So it, it's not really fraud because it's labeled correctly, but sometimes it's misleading if you're going to buy Italian olive oil and the olives aren't Italian. So um, what I was told by the olive oil experts is the best olive oil to buy is from California, and then you're more assured to be actually getting what you're paying for. All right, uh, we're going to end with uh, one question. Um, so when you do, you know, this type of testing, are you, especially for cannabis, um, are you most, um, do you try and make uh, um, agreements between, you know, the chemical fingerprint, you know, this is the composition and then the efficacy or are you worried about safety or um, other issues, uh, you know, when you identify that chemical composition, I guess, what does it really tell you about the product? Okay, yes, well, you know what's in it, but can yeah. you really make the next yeah. conclusions? Well, let me do the safety part first. So typically with the spectral methods that we use, they're so sensitive, we work with very dilute solutions. So um, the main risk would be someone dropping a test tube on their foot or something and cutting themselves. But the, the concentrations are low enough that that's not a risk. And the, the amounts are, are not enough. We did have a project with that where we were going to correlate the uh, spectral features with um, the pharmacological effects from people that uh, were using um, different samples from vendors they would fill out a survey and they would put down their preferences, um, how they felt, how they felt an hour later, why they liked that specific um, mm -hmm. sample or, or plant. But then the, the person, this is with a, a colleague of mine, Steve Baugh in um, Colorado. He died suddenly of a heart attack and the mm -hmm. project ended. So um, at some point we would like to continue that. Again, we need to find a collaborator that's sort of tied into the distributors and can administer the surveys to the uh, customers. That's good for the customers, too, because then we give them feedback in terms of what other samples have similar properties as the ones that, that happen to be their favorite. So well, they, I know that they do that a lot with wines. They say, if you like this varietal, you might want to try this. So that would be interesting to apply it to other natural products. Right. So in the dispensaries, they have these uh, people called bud tenders, like bartender, but with bud. But mm -hmm. most of their advice is all anecdotal. They don't. There's no real science to it. So this is sort of one of the areas we wanted to go into is trying to get the science into this industry and, and guidance, um, especially for medicinal uh, purposes. So, for example, if you have arthritis or sore knee, there may be specific um, plants, basically. Uh, most of them are hybrids, so specific hybrids that may treat that pain better than just a generic blend. Okay. Well, I think we need to wrap up, but I wanted to thank you so much for a really interesting cafe. I know that there was a lot more that you could have covered, but I would tell people that if they are interested, uh, that they can reach out to you directly. I know that you're incredibly responsive to people's questions. So I just wanted to thank you so much for wrapping up our science cafe series for this year and we will see everybody next fall so thank yep. you hopefully i'll see you next fall and get my cup of coffee that's right i and, owe you yeah then also um i'm always happy to do it again on a different topic so thank you okay, it's a wrap. all right bye-bye